Howdy, Rex here. And Lou, the FDC. The Slapdash FDC? Slapdash FDC. <laughs> I haven't heard that one long time. That was a good one. It's a good term. Yeah. So as you uh, remember from the former dramatization of shooter spotter team dynamics that got a little bit out of hand and turned into a full-fledged movie, um, we had to kind of stage the event in a drama in order to kind of really film what was really going on. So it's uh, kind of a dramatization. And it was kind of our best attempt to capture all of the action, all of the communication, and uh, put more of a realistic spin on what Hollywood would have you believe that goes on between a <laughs> sniper and a spotter and their dynamics in the field. So yeah, what, what you're going to have between the spotter and the shooter is a dialogue, and you're going to establish your own little language that's going to really streamline what's going on out there, because if you have two people on a team, they have to be cohesive, they have to stick together, and you have to know exactly what the other person is talking about, you have to know exactly what they're doing. You're going to have different tasks, the spotter and the shooter are going to be responsible for different tasks, so it's not always one person totally keeping an eye on the other person and it's important for them to let each other know exactly what they're doing and for the other person to let the other person know that they heard that curiosity alpha sector trp5 right 15 add five roger that get the big eye on it Partially obscured, no positive identification, possible high value target. Alpha Sector, TRP5, right 15, add 5. All right, target acquired. Roger that. The biggest problem you'll see when you have teams of people out there doing long range precision shooting is a lack of communication adding up to a big screw up. Someone said, adjust for left and then he just figured the other person heard it, and then... You should never assume. <laughs> so clear communication is very important, and that's what this video is gonna be about. We're gonna kinda decode what was going on in that situation that we dramatized. And with that, there's kind of an order of operations that needs to be followed too. Everybody's gotta fulfill certain tasks in order to uh, complete the mission, whatever that might be. Yep, whether you're hunting deer or two-legged critters, it don't really matter. You're gonna be investing enough time into this and you might only have one shot, so you need to make a count and you need to do it kinda of in short order. So the less screwing around that's going on, stumbling around with the communication, the better. And so every sniper and spotter team will come up with their own unique lingo and jargon to make the uh, everything as efficient and streamlined as possible and the dramatization that we had was just one such instance. Hit three o'clock, went through the top of the shoulder. Prepare to re-engage. Once this round cooks for a second, it should bring you up. Knock your elevation down one click. Keep your hold at 1.1. Roger that. On site. Just let me know when. The dramatization that we had was just one such instance. Yeah, just an example of a set of terms that people might develop. And it doesn't really matter. Now, if you're operating in a certain branch of the service, they're going to have a different set of slang than like maybe law enforcement. Or if you go to Poland, they're going to have different slang in a different language. So whatever language you speak, if you're a cowboy, if you're a rap guy, if you're from a big city, whoever you and the other teammate is, you're going to develop this language. And really the important thing is that those two people understand what that is. See, uh, a lot of people think there's universal jargon between the two of them, and that's not really the case. It's something that can be totally developed on the fly uh, as you're shooting with each other. It is good to uh, understand a few of the universal ones if you're gonna be operating with a diversity of folks and you don't know who you're gonna be paired up with. So there are certain things you wanna understand all the concepts. 
And so with that, you have tried to accomplish certain things in the process as well. Moving through the process here and the things that each part of the team need to accomplish, um, is it fair to say that the spotter, they, they've got a lot more paperwork to do? With yeah, that's kind of true. I mean, the, the spotter, and it, it varies depending on which kind of team you have, but uh, typically the spotter will be tasking himself with getting ready for the potential shot. They're going to have a, a, an area where they're going to expect the target to probably show up or a group of areas and some and they also have to cover all the other bases for all the different possible areas the target might pop up so he's going to be busy getting hasty firing solutions ready for any potential spot where a target might present itself um, so what he's going to be doing and you're going to have a lot of time to uh, do this most likely in most instances because this is like hours and days laying there waiting for a target to present itself on a serious operation right whether that be that uh, Boone and Crockett mule deer or whatever and so your spotter is going to be figuring out ahead of time target reference points okay and we show TRPs yep and that's what we refer to as TRPs and a lot well you can have whatever term you want you can give them names but you're gonna draw out a range card like we showed you in the prior video you're gonna draw a picture of the landscape you're gonna have all your different target reference points conspicuous looking things out there in the field things that stick out like a goofy looking red rock or whatever you could name it or whatever uh, you could name it Grover or whatever you wanted to or you could name it Pete or, or whatever and or you can name it TRP, target reference point number one, target reference point number two. At any rate, you have all this stuff figured out ahead of time. And those are all labeled within their uh, appropriate sectors. Right? Yep, so you'll have sectors of fire. And if you missed that video, you can go back and look at how you set up a, a range card. And uh, we kind of explain that in pretty good detail. Uh, so you're gonna have your different target reference points, your different sectors of uh, fire, of where you're gonna have these different areas divided up. And the purpose of that is so that when a target does present itself, boom, you can immediately identify exactly where you're talking about. A lot of times you're out there, like in the mountains or in the prairie, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's gonna be kind of a uniform looking landscape sometimes. You got a bunch of trees, and all of a sudden you see a target pop up, oh, there's a, a deer popped up next to that tree over there. Yeah, which tree? And but, you're gonna if, be, but if you have Alpha Sector target reference point number two. Yeah, which was a certain conspicuous rock that you identified way ahead of time. You know right where you're talking about. Yeah, so that's the purpose of having those sectors of fire and your target reference points figured out ahead of time. And that's something that's like super important. And those, are, and those are all hasty solutions and when, yep. you, when you get into identifying, when your spotter identifies your target, then you'll get into your precise solution. Yep, so you refine it from there. So the spotter is going to be figuring out all these different target reference points and he'll probably have on that card uh, drawn up in a pencil or something so he can adjust it as needed. Uh, a, a hasty, a quick, accessible firing solution. The basic elevation and like maybe a hold off value for windage for like a 10 mile an hour wind. So that if something pops up, he can immediately look at his card and say, okay, get dialed in for TRP number five. And the shooter will have a copy of that as well because you're both going to be drawing up the range card or the spotter can communicate that to the shooter. Index seven minutes on the optic or whatever. So that's something that you can get you right on target right away rather than trying to figure out how far it is, you know, in a hurry when because when you're in a hurry and you want to shoot all of a sudden you have this thing called adrenaline and it like removes all of your fine motor skills it, re it removes all of your thinking you turn real stupid real quick when you get excited especially when you have a weapon in your hands okay that's just kind of how it works in real life so having all them details or as many of those details hammered out ahead of time as many as you can as possible, the way better off it's going to be. Simplify it, streamline it ahead of time. So all that downtime should be used as preparation time to get ready and after everything's figured out, then you can have your nutter butters in the grass and talk about the Kardashians and her, <laughs> exactly. her, uh, her landing pad problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's very important, the first element of the team communication effort is to both get on the same page with what your sectors of fire are, where your target reference points are, and make sure you both are intimately familiar with what all those different things are in the field.
A lot of preparation and a lot of communication. Exactly. Yep. So once we've got all that established and we're hanging out and we're waiting, um, waiting for whatever the target may be, waiting for the big 30-point buck to come through the trees, um, after the spotter locates that, that's when the pace of the action picks up. Yeah. And that's when things start to get real. Yep. So what you're going to have to do is whoever identified the target is going to have to obviously notify the other person they identified a target. And you can have a, you know, just simple as target up. Curiosity. Or curiosity. You know, that the language we used in the video there when she said curiosity was she saw something. She didn't know exactly what it was, so she's curious. There's something curious over there. So they developed their own terminology. And you can develop whatever terminology you want. But in that, in the case of our example, that's what that meant. Curiosity. She sees something in the grass there, and she doesn't know what it is, and that alerts the spotter to. And then she goes on to identify exactly where it's at using a target reference point system. And so, after the target is identified, then we start working on a more precise firing solution. That's correct. And not only that, but all of the different logistics that go into the rifle as well, whether it's your. Uh, your chamber temperature mm -hmm. or your uh, any obstructions in yep. the way. There a lot of a lot of details. Now, typically, your shooter's going to be so overwhelmed with the task of actually handling the weapon and making the kill that the spotter's going to be maybe the more collected one. And a lot of times, your spotter's going to be the more senior person out there. It depends on which uh, outfit you're working with. Some some outfits it's the opposite way, uh, but the spotter's going to be kind of responsible for maintaining the directive, like maintaining the, the flow of information and walking the shooter through all the steps to get make sure that firing solution's dialed and make sure they're pointed at the right target and get them ready to shoot. Target is now on the crawl, coming in our direction. Roger that, keep on them. Uh, wait till we get a clear identification. Make that win hold 1.1. Holding 1.1. Target is still on sight. Roger that. I got a clear visual. It's definitely him. Roger that. Stay cool. Can you see if he's got it? Stay ready. I don't see it. We want to be sure. He's got to have it. Stay cool. Hold your fire. Stay on sight. Still holding 1.1 on sight. Because the shooter, there's enough uh, small details ergonomically. The shooter's going to be focusing in on the four fundamentals of marksmanship. Just pulling off the shot is going to really take up a lot of the shooter's energy. So the spotter is going to take care of the cerebral part of it, typically, and uh, make sure that the shooter's on sight. The other thing, too, is that both people are going to be continuously cross-checking each other as well. If they're a good team, one person isn't going to be solely responsible for everything. They're both going to be aware of all the fundamentals, hopefully, to where they can correct each other and cross-check. Because I'll tell you, two brains is a lot better than one, especially in an exciting situation. Checks and balances. Yeah, exactly. Because you'd be surprised the silly stuff that happens out there. And a lot of it due to simple, stupid mistakes. Lack, yes. Lack of communication or yep. just that adrenaline flowing. Yep, and, and just a lack of watching over what the other person is doing. It's uh, nice when the, when the spotter's laying behind the shooter like we showed how to situate that. Uh, so that the spotter can watch everything the shooter is doing to make sure that, for example, you give the shooter a firing solution. Index seven minutes on the optic or seven mils or whatever you're using, whatever system. And he can actually physically watch that get dialed in. And as this is happening, one thing that they should both be doing is communicating that, Roger that, I heard you. Because a lot of times the person is so focused in on their task, whatever they're thinking about, they didn't even hear what you're saying. So communicating, it, it might sound redundant, and it sounds kind of stupid on film. It's not Hollywood cool because it's it's like, roger that, roger that, roger that, roger that, and, and just repeating what the other person said, but it's incredibly important. If the person is dialing in seven on the optic, they should clearly communicate that back to the spotter. Yes, I heard you, and it was seven. And then the spotter could be at ease, like, okay, yep, you betcha, I heard you, you got it right. So you have to clearly articulate exactly what's going on, and then that person has to 
reflect that back to, to let the other person know. They both got to know what each other are doing. You know what I'm saying? So at the same time, while each of the parties is responsible for keeping each other in check and a certain amount of the same responsibilities, each of them is also responsible for specific duties that make the operation happen mm -hmm. and their expertise within either being the spotter or the sniper. Exactly. So as they're walking through uh, figuring out a firing solution, the spotter might ask the shooter for give me a mill reading and that would be in reference to verifying a target distance uh, you know just to double to cross-check everything because like we discussed in the former videos you don't want to depend a hundred percent on a laser you don't want to depend a hundred percent on aerial photography uh, or maps you want to kind of cross-check everything as much as you can you want to make sure that you're good so verifying if you have time obviously if you don't have time then you just go with that hasty solution that she had predetermined and you don't have time so what are you going to do you'll get as close as you can so really any downtime you any downtime you have you really want to make that count especially after the target has uh, made itself clear and before you're going to make that shot that's crucial time to come up with the precision firing solution and for example too another thing uh if for example the target's on the move uh the shooter who or whoever's Keeping an eye on the target is going to want to communicate that. If the target looks like it's partially obscured, the shooter's going to want to communicate that to the spotter as well because they're going to have slightly different perspectives. And if the shooter's not comfortable shooting through grass or uh, doesn't feel like the target's totally presented, that's something that you just want to communicate. So the last thing you want to do on a team is to hold any information to yourself assuming the other person knew it. That's like the key golden rule to the whole deal. Do not assume that the other team member knows what you're thinking or knows what you're going to do. Just say it. Just say it clearly, and then you both know. And when the other person hears it, they should, you know, acknowledge that they heard what you said. So that's incredibly important. So in the movie, we had them go through the whole firing solution. They uh, talked about the target cover. Uh, they got the mill reading. The mirage. I found that really interesting, too, how you can... Uh pick up on wind and distance through mirage. Yep, and a lot of that stuff is going to require a couple people because it's, uh, you know, one person's going to be making mathematical calculations and the other one might have to use the optic mm -hmm. um, and they might need to cross-check each other. And so, absolutely, all the different complexities of determining all the various aspects of your firing solution, you need to communicate to each other in real time as you're doing it and they should both kind of be cross-checking each other. Because, like we said, when you're excited with adrenaline, you get real stupid and it's very easy to make a really stupid mistake. In the movie, there was a, a part where they did a temperature reading. Uh, the situation was such that the target was very small. The, all they had was a headshot due to the circumstances of the mission. They couldn't settle for a body shot. If they could help it, they'd prefer a headshot. So, in a quest to get this precise firing solution they wanted to get an accurate chamber reading so an example of how to communicate that is that they develop their own language the chamber's reading 93 degrees the rest are in the box waiting to cook roger that 93 degrees it's not enough to bump it down yet uh, once we start at the oven we'll bump them down uh, for now, keep your elevation at 4.4. And for the chick out there who was shooting, you know, maybe the oven was kind of the, <laughs> the way of looking at it. That's, I don't know, folks. That's, That's terrible. terrible. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, the, the, the dishwasher's reading at 87 degrees. <laughs> you did do great, though, Margaret. Oh, yeah, I, I think that might not go in there. Let's try that again. <laughs> Let's try the temperature. So for example, there's a part where they have to get a temperature reading of the chamber because the target's so small in the circumstances and uh, they want it to be real precise. So they develop the language, right? And you know, what's the oven reading at? So they develop their own lingo referring to the chamber as the oven, you know? And uh, you know, when we start to cook them off, that means start shooting, your chamber's gonna warm up. So they had developed their own little custom dialogue. And there's no universal custom dialogue for any of that. 
But there is a lot of science involved. Yes. There's a lot of numbers and math and you need somebody who knows how to run a calculator. Yeah. And, and someone who's familiar with the general dynamics of the craft. Because for someone who's real familiar with this, even if you don't understand the exact lingo, usually the lingo is going to reflect it somehow. So for example, they'd figure it out, okay, what's the oven reading at when we start up the oven? It's going to be pretty obvious that they're talking about the chamber warming up. So just being very familiar with what you're doing is going to help that out a bit too. And then you have a little more wiggle room as far as how you communicate. And sometimes metaphors can explain a lot more, a lot more quickly than trying to get all scientific. So there's nothing wrong with using metaphors and cute little phrases and whatever you got going on out there. Whatever works, whatever you guys can understand. So after the target's identified, after the precise solution has been calculated and indexed, then it's time to order the shot. Yeah, okay. Now this is something that you want to get exactly right to because the, shoot, the spotter is going to have to clearly communicate when the spotter is ready to spot. So the command to fire, that's like important. You don't want to be shooting while the other person is not quite ready because the, the, the spotter is going to have to be comfortable behind his optic as well to where he, okay, he's done blinking, he's focused, he's getting ready to spot that mirage. And we're going to talk about that in the next video, spotting your rounds, which is a really interesting task. But uh, the spotter is going to be almost in, in a real refined task as much as the shooter is. Mm -hmm. Because he's going to be looking for something that's almost invisible. That spotting that trace sometimes is very difficult to do. And then he's going to immediately going to have to assess the shot and determine exactly where it hit. And uh, so the shooter can't shoot until the command of fire is given. And that's something where you're going to hear some language. A lot of guys will say, you know, red light. That means don't shoot yet. I ain't ready. Green light. Okay, now you're, you're green. Go ahead and take the shot whenever you're ready or send it, that's more of an urgent command, like send it now because the target's about to get away, the conditions are about to change, the wind only let up for a short amount of time and it's about to pick up again, so send it right now. So there's different levels of urgency in these fire commands as well. So you want to develop your language to reflect those situations as well. Absolutely. You know what we're saying? And so after the shot is ordered, yep. everybody's got to be ready, both parties have to be ready, mm -hmm. and after the shot is made, the spotter's responsible for watching it and seeing if yep. indeed it did hit the target and if it did or if it didn't, if you need to fire again. Exactly. So there's the, both people are going to have to communicate immediately after you give the command to fire and the shot is sent. There's two different things. The spotter's going to be responsible for kind of determining where the shot went and the shooter's going to be responsible for verifying where they were at when the shot went off. <laughs> Hit three o'clock, went through the top of the shoulder. Prepare to re-engage. Once this round cooks for a second, it should bring you up. Knock your elevation down one click. Keep your hold at 1.1. Roger that. On site. Just let me know when. Wind should shift back in a second here. Green light. Oh. Big red is out of the game. The spotter's going to be responsible for kind of determining where the shot went, and the shooter's going to be responsible for verifying where they were at when the shot went off. Because sometimes you wiggle. And if you wiggled like a foot, and it hit a foot to the right, your spotter needs to know that. Because if he issues a correction for something that was the shooter's fault for wiggling, you're going to be like twice as far off on the next time. So what you're going to have immediately after the shot is fired, um, if the shooter wiggled, they're going to say, I pulled it to the left about a foot. And the spotter will say, Roger that, I heard you. You want to let him know. And the spotter will determine where that hit. And as soon as the spotter determines where that hit was, they're going to instantly communicate that. They're going to say, uh, hit, 3 o'clock of zero, 
three inches. And then a uh, shooter will say, roger that. And then they'll uh, issue a command to either do a follow-up shot or stand by or whatever. But all that stuff needs to be clearly communicated. And it has to be streamlined because that's the moment of truth right there. And that's the moment where a lot of people kind of forget to communicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the key crucial moment. Like the, like the shooter's laying down and he's kind of getting ready to shoot. And he assumes it's time to fire. And the spotter ain't quite ready. And so the shot's blown because he shot, the target ran away, and now you have no clue what the heck happened. If he hit it, if he missed it, nobody knows what happened. So you like blew like three days worth of work because you didn't communicate properly. There is no command to give a shot properly. Or the shot is made good and uh, the spotter misidentifies like where it hit or something. You know, there, There's a lot of things that are going to go wrong automatically, so a lack of communication is only going to amplify all that. It's going to be enough weird stuff happening to where you don't need to just throw more stuff, more <laughs> monkey wrenches into the gears to try to screw it up. It's worse. a good way to put it. It's a good way to put it. <laughs> so, yeah, essentially it's uh, communication, teamwork, and just being aware and cognizant and in control, cool, calm, and collected yeah. of the whole situation and being able to uh, take the mission through to completion, whatever that might be. And... With that, I, we, we tried to put that all into action with a dramatization, mm -hmm. which got a little carried away, but it showed just the pace of the whole action from the preparation and just waiting and all the downtime, eating the nutter butters and all of that to w when uh, everything gets serious and all of a sudden the action picks up and everybody has to do their job and have to do away with any human error. Mm-hmm. So when in doubt, communicate extra. Absolutely. Don't just assume the other person knows what you're thinking. That's really the lesson. Just make sure whatever you're doing, the other person knows exactly what that is. And I think that overall, it's a pretty good illustration of the dynamic teamwork that two professionals who are in control, what they can do out in the field. Rock and roll. Absolutely. Communicate. Oh, that's it.